If you have a Bible, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give you the book first because then you'll be reading ahead and you'll mess up my sermon. So you can get the book on your way out today. Ushers will have little tickets for you because we have one size t-shirts fit everybody except you. <laughs> my mother, I was preaching in Singapore. Have you ever been to Singapore? Well, there are very slight people there. Like if you're five foot two, you're like in the, the you're like in their NBA as a center. They're just, they're not very vertically enhanced. And, and so my mother, of course, was five foot eight and beautiful lady she was. Went to be with the Lord January 20th of last year and I miss her terribly. She was the business administrator of this great ministry from inception to when she went to heaven. And she wouldn't let you spend a paper money for a paper clip she didn't know about. And I promise you that's true. 375 employees. And she knew what every one of them made and how many hours they worked. I promise you. And uh, so we're in Singapore and she loved to shop. And so she's going from store to store. She's just frantic because she has found nothing to buy. She finally walked in a store totally exacerbated and worn out and tired. And the service was in about an hour and a half. And she had to get back to the hotel and get changed. So she walked into this beautiful little boutique. And she said to the gentleman there, do you have anything? just anything that would fit me. He said, no problem. We have one size fit everybody. So he went to the shelf and he pulled off the biggest one and he held it up and it came to about here on her and he said, except you. <laughs> That's funny, I don't care who you are. All right, let's talk about grace just a little bit. You want to? Reach over to your neighbor and say, hold on. He's from Kentucky, but he talks fast. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. If you don't have it right there on your lap or your iPhone or your iPad or in your Bible, it's right here for you. Don't you realize that grace frees you? Everybody shout, I'm free. I'm free. But that's not the end of the sentence. And that's where modern Christianity gets into all kinds of quagmires because they take that sentence and they end it at the word free. And therefore, they lose all of the theological meaning of what God's overwhelming grace is all about. So join me and let's read the rest of it. Don't you realize that grace frees you to choose your own master? God so values your own personal freedom that he gives you the ability to choose. Now, what a God, what a revelation, what an understanding that you are not an automaton, that God is not directing you like a pawn on life's chessboard, that what Christ actually did when he was bleeding, by which the very veins of God himself were emptied on Calvary's rugged, cruel, angry, mean, biting beam. He suffered those agonies. He was tempted through that torture because he was purchasing back something for you. And immediately you will say eternal life, not so. Immediately you will say freedom from my sins, not so. Immediately you will say my best life now, not so. That is not the reason that Jesus Christ became the supreme sacrifice and propitiation for your sins and mine. No, the reason he became that great unspeakable gift of God the Father was singular in nature and it was this. He gave his life to give you and me the ability to choose. It's quiet in this church. I said, he gave you and I the ability to choose. God requires no one to go to heaven, requires no one to serve him on this earth. 
God requires no one to go to hell. People say, well, I would never serve a God who would send people to a place like that, the eternal incarceration of the hopeless and helpless, doomed and damned souls of lost humanity, where they would perish forever and forever and forever. I would never serve a God who would do that. Well, I'm glad to offer you Jesus today because Jesus sends no one to hell. And if anyone ever goes there, it's because they made the conscious decision to reject the free gift of salvation for the God's word says the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord however God says I set before you this day life death blessing cursing you choose aren't you glad he gave you back your right to free moral agency okay three people aren't you thankful that God let you choose. Now, I want to go somewhere there, but I'll, I'll resist the temptation, Dr. Murphy. I will say to you only that the rest of the verse declares choose carefully. We live in a generation that wants to assume no personal responsibility for anything. We live in the blame somebody else generation. It's never my fault. I was born on the wrong side of the tracks. I've always wondered what the right side was. Because I know people that are extremely wealthy that have no peace. And I know folks that are extremely poor that have no peace. I know folks that are extremely wealthy that have great peace, and I know folks that are extremely poor that have no peace. I can tell you, I've had none and some. Some is better. Oh, always take some. And enough is never enough because you can always find somebody who doesn't have enough. Are you in this building with me right now? So you choose. It hadn't always been like this. I mean, look around this place. It hadn't always been like this. What's the right side of the tracks? My family's from Eastern Kentucky. Don't think bluegrass, Pastor Deegan. I didn't know what bluegrass was. If our grass was blue, it was because we painted the dirt with blue. We didn't have a lawn. We swept the yard. You're not listening to me. You don't believe that. I was raised so far back in the woods, hoot owls didn't show up till we used hoot owls for roosters. And here it is, June bugs didn't show up till August. That's a long way back yonder where the sun showed up about 10 in the morning and the sun went down about three in the afternoon because of those rocky, craggy hillsides that were all around us as my... rats as big as cats but my mom and dad said wait a minute God gave me the ability to choose so they said I choose not to be bound by my past I choose not to be bound by my circumstances I choose to always either be up or getting up I choose to never be down I choose to cut out cardboard and put in the bottom of my shoes and walk to my second job So we believed, we trusted God. We found out if you give 10% of your income, according to Malachi and Hebrews, God would bless you. 
So we chose. You choose right now to be happy. Okay, that went over big. I'm going to try the awake folks right back there. I said, God gives you the ability to choose because you got way more to reach out for than to hold on to. I'm talking to somebody right now. I'm talking to somebody that feels like you're only down and today God's lifting down a hand over the sapphire sill of heaven's gate and saying, come on up here. Shout, I'm moving on up. I'm going to finish my text. Choose carefully. For you surrender yourself to become a servant bound to the one you choose to obey. Today, I choose life. Today, I choose victory. Today, I choose hope. Today, I choose joy. Today, I choose grace. Today, I choose mercy. Today I choose victory. Today I choose health. Today I choose that I can change my tomorrow by the words from his word I declare and decree today. Touch somebody and say the guy's preaching pretty good today. Here we go. So the question becomes, are you a son or are you a slave? Touch your neighbor and say, you're a son or a slave? Because there's no in-between. There's no gray area. You're either in or you're out. You're either whole or you're not. My God. Are you a son or are you a slave? The clamorous controversy between supposed diametrically opposed extremes of law and grace circulating throughout the modern church are easily illustrated by the simple distinction between slavery and sonship. A slave, you see, is required to follow a set of written ordinances which are often harshly enforced and observed involuntarily due to a culture imposed upon them of fear and punishment. That's a slave. Roman crucifixion itself. Let's go way, way back 2,000 years ago on that craggy hill called the place of the skull. Roman crucifixion actually began not as a form of execution, but rather as a form of public punishment for the public torture of slaves. It was designed to terrify the rest of the enslaved populace into absolute compliant servitude. God recorded his law in the Ten Commandments. Any of you know any of them? They're very interesting. You should read them sometime. Things like, you shall not kill. Uh, things like, you shall not steal. Uh, things like, you shall not covet. But what often happens is that God's ten laws morph and multiply into thousands of man-made requirements. This is the essence of religious bondage. We've all heard and experienced this. Pastor Lowe, we, we understand what it's like for folk just to talk about things like the length of your sleeves, how you wear your hair, going to the movie or not going to the movie or going to the ball game or not going to the ball game or going to the dance or not going to dance. Now I told you, you get to choose. And if you get the choice, my suggestion is dance. <laughs> my suggestion is obey the Bible, clap. My suggestion is obey the Bible, shout. My suggestion is obey the Bible, wave. My suggestion is obey the Bible, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. If you get the chance to dance, baby, dance. Often a loving God, therefore, becomes depicted. I said he is love. Why? The totality of the law can be summed up in this. 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That spirit, soul, and body. But religion has you believe in an angry tyrant God willing to disavow anyone and everyone who attempts to enjoy any measure of freedom. True freedom. God forbid that his people purchased by his blood, by his cross, should fail and fall into the error of thinking that pleasing God is about some form of external appearances. Holiness has been and will forever be first and foremost a matter of the human heart. You understand that the problem of the human heart is the heart of the human problem. Tweet that. Are you with me? It's an inside problem. It's an inside job. It's not an external problem. It's a matter of our hearts being submitted to God's law through the power of the Holy Spirit. Somebody just say, I believe what he's saying right now. Let me talk to you about a son on the other hand. A son on the other hand serves willingly from a heart, not on the basis of obligation enforced by fear. That's religion. God does not force you to attend church. God does not force you to be a good moral person. God does not force you to do anything. In fact, God forever surrendered his right. Huh. Shove your neighbor and say he's about to get deep now. Some of you said deep, you're stuck. Watch. God, never forget this. God forever surrendered his right to act independently in your life. Well, why won't God do this? Well, why won't God do that? Well, it looks like God would do thus and so. God has already done what God intends to do. His will is established. 1,166 pages of his will. You're the heir. Read it. Because in there he said, I'll give you eternal life. In there he said, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and that you be in health even as your soul prospers. In there he said, You are the head and not the tail. In there he said, You are above and you are not beneath. In there he said, I'll cause you to ride on the wild wings of the morning. There he said, I'll cause you to build your nest among the snow-capped peaks of mighty mountains. There he said, I will renew your strength like that of the eagle. There he said, He was wounded for your transgressions bruised for your iniquities the chastisement of your peace was laid upon him and with and by his stripes you were and therefore are healed whole i dare you to say that's a good good god unfortunately the issue in religious circles seems to become those who would maintain that a son has responsibility to serve only himself. The prodigal son had that kind of an attitude in Luke 15. He demanded his inheritance. He took it. He wasted it on riotous living, your Bible says. His sonship, therefore, became his own personal slavery. He used God's provision. For himself. Hmm. Here's a paradox. Here's a seeming contradiction. I maintain that that prodigal son became a slave a long time before he left the father's house. Before he found himself in a hog pen and would have died were it not for the husk 
that the swine did he thus our text says Romans 6 16 don't you realize grace frees you I double dare you to shout I am free free to choose your own master but choose carefully if you surrender yourself to become a servant bound to the one you choose to obey the prodigal did what those that advocate a false and contemptible and worthless form of grace do today i am weary with the cheapening the wholesale marketing of a false truth regarding the grace of God. They take the manifold blessing of God, all that God wants to do, and they squander it upon themselves, upon their own desires, the desires of their flesh, the pride of life. These are they who do not love their own lives even unto death. Look, this thing isn't just about this temporal existence. <laughs> oh, that we would be eternally mindful only for a moment. That we would think in terms beyond the immediate temporal. The prodigal lost everything, even lost his self-respect. He became indistinguishable, watch this preacher, from the culture of his day. He lived with the hogs. He, he was worse off than the hogs. They were fulfilling their purpose. Are you? He was not achieving his purpose. He finally recognized that even his father's servants were better off than he was. And you and I must avoid either of these two extremes, being bound by legalism or being bound by a false, cheap version of God's unparalleled grace. Shout, thank God for grace. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German theologian and anti-Nazi dissident said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come, watch, and die. We bid come and dine. God bids come and die. For self-sacrifice, my dear brother and sister, is entry-level Christianity. Here is the great command. Love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Ah. Please don't think that God is some sort of eternal vending machine, and you use his word as a coin to slip it in the slot and get from God whatever it is you want. Remember that Israel asked for a king, and God granted the desire of their heart. And your Bible said their request and his answer sent leanness into their souls. Good God, I came to say a thing today. Bonhoeffer said, God calls a man, he calls him, come and die. Hmm, the cross. Now here we go. The cross is the issue. The cross, it's the issue. It's the very heart of the matter regarding law and grace. You can have all the airy theological debates you desire and as many good old fashioned knock down drag out religious fights as seem appropriate, none of which will change the truth that once the human soul glimpses the meaning of Calvary's cross, once a man or a woman has seen the Lamb of God 
scourged and bolted to that angry, mean, biting beam. Once we allow the reason he endured it all to capture and take hostage our hearts, God's law, his grace, cease to be issues. They are no longer controversies. They are no longer mysteries to ponder or problems to debate, but solid gospel truth shouted by our expiring Savior from that angry rail. His abounding grace becomes his glorious gift to be received in absolute awe and transcendent wonder. His law then becomes a guardrail to give us a boundary of safety and protection drawn by a loving Father's powerful hand instead of struggling with the law, instead of kicking against the pricks, we sing all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate straight fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all, Lord of our thoughts, Lord of every desire. Lord of our possessions, Lord of our time, Lord of our talent, Lord of our things. The very thought of his unspeakable gift and supreme sacrifice must provoke a humble response of sheer gratitude and strict obedience. Again, the cross is the issue. It ends all the debate for no one. No one who truly understands the power of that tormented tree walks away to explain away the requirements of a holy God. No one captivated by Calvary desires to be free from the restraints of a God who sent his son off to war in the service of his furious love. The cross, that's the issue. The cross is the issue. Earlier generations knew it. There's much to be gained by return to the discarded values of the past. Our founding fathers routinely signed their letters and said goodbye to their friends with the Latin words, memento mori, memento mori. Memento more, memento more. Sign their letters, not sincerely, but memento more. Said goodbye, not adios, but memento more. Remember death. Hey. Would to God that in the busyness of our day, at some point, we would memento mori. They reminded one another of the death of Jesus Christ, a method of provoking one another to holy living, saying, remember this, you will die. Remember what legacy you will leave on that final day when you exhale your last breath. Remember death and live differently because you do. I preached a message the week after my father went to his eternal reward. I called it consider death. I took my text from Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 29. Oh, that they were wise. Oh, that they understood this. Oh, that they would consider their latter end. Death. It's like sin, isn't it? It's one thing we all have in common, but you can't find a preacher in America with the bravery to ever talk about it until the funeral service. You don't get it. Let me slip this in parenthetically. It's a bit too late then. We don't look for death. No one got up this morning and said, I hope this is the day I go to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I prefer not to go today. 
but death searches for us. Death is certain, sealing, sudden for every one of us. There's only one other option, the great rapture of the church. But I have no time to discuss that with you today. And we've been looking for that promise for over 2,000 years. But know this, the death rate among human persons remains stubbornly at 100%. The truths of law, the truths of grace will remain blurred and foggy until they are illuminated by Calvary and brought into focus by Calvary's Lamb. There can be no meaningful discussion of how law and grace must work in harmony in our lives unless we have a powerful confrontation with that cross. Our righteous Redeemer left the glories of heaven and condescended to the cemetery planet, subjecting himself to the limitations of human flesh. Here he came to die. And in a final indignity, far below his station, he subjected himself to sinful men, allowed them to violate him, to humiliate him, and to crucify him. Then came that agonizing final week in Jerusalem. The religious leaders had already decided to put him to death. By the time Jesus finished his final meal with his disciples, the plot was irrevocably set in motion. Guided by the traitor, the officials who sought his life found him in a secluded garden under the full light of a Passover moon. As all alone he was. More alone than any human being had ever been. He was apprehended. He was taken away. The cowards who swore they would never leave him scooted away into darkness. What followed so ghastly, we want to look away. But we dare not if we hope to understand, if we pray for the mystery of law and grace to be unraveled, enabling us to live lives worthy of everything he endured. He was blindfolded. He was mocked. He was scorned. He, he was ridiculed. He was beaten. His beard yanked from his face. He was spat upon and relegated to solitary confinement in a cold, damp dungeon overnight. The next morning, he was sentenced to death and scourged. Now we want to pass quickly over this matter of scourging. But since it's presented in scripture as a vital requirement of divine justice, we must consider it in all of its implications. Scourging, different than whipping. And we're familiar with that in whipping. Mm. The purpose is to cut. Mm. Not so in scourging. Scourging, rather, the goal is not simply to cut, but to tear. To tear in bleeding, shredded ribbons, flesh from bone. The scourge was devised so that the long leather straps would wrap around the man's torso. And then the lictor, skilled in his art, knew exactly when the hard metal pieces of bone and and iron tied into the ends of those straps had wrapped fully enough around his torso. He would then flick his wrists so they would dig in and fling away pieces of his body. Our suffering Savior was required to carry his own crossbeam, bleeding through the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem. There to the place of execution, he's barely alive. Jesus arrived at Golgotha, the place of the skull. Iron spikes were driven through tortured skin and implanted into splintered wood. He was bolted to that beam, and then the cross was lowered 
with a horrible thud into the post hole prepared before for him. Now the true agony of crucifixion ensued. The Romans wanted a slow, ghastly public death. They proposed to torture their victim in order to pacify demented men and warn their slaves. They wanted the suffering to be so shocking that it would never be forgotten. So a method of slow strangling, strang, strangling was employed. The only way for him to get a breath, since he could take in air but he could not exhale, was to lift himself up on those iron spikes through each ankle. For six agonizing hours, Jesus hung there beaten, battered, bruised, swung up between heaven and earth, gasping for air, raking his torn flesh against the biting beam. Beyond his physical suffering was the torment he endured from taking upon himself the sins of the entire world. Can you imagine the horror of unregenerate humanity, every rape, every child molestation, every murder, every theft, every evil deed of every person throughout all the ages was placed upon our sinless Savior. Finally, mercifully, it ended. Jesus said as much. It is finished. Now there it is. There's the truth that moved me to describe the horrors of his sufferings in such detail. Friend, until we truly confront the cross, until we identify ourselves with it, we are not fully finished with sin until the meaning of the cross is embedded in our souls and upon our minds the full meaning of a liberated Christian life cannot be ours here Paul I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I that live but Christ that lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me to take on the Christ life is to be dead to sin. It is to abhor sin, to see it for what it really is and to turn entirely from it, not to ignore its reality, not to ignore its penalty, for the wages of sin is still death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, not of works, lest any man should boast, but by grace, through faith are you saved mm. to be a Christian to be a Christian is to let go of this world to take on the nature of the one who died for us listen a culture that emphasizes entitlement mm. has no interest in heaven and no fear of hell it has no interest of life that suggests anything other than how much they deserve and success by how much they possess. Any message from any pulpit involving facing opposition or doing hard work any mention of self-sacrifice or servanthood has very little appeal to people who believe, after all, they deserve everything. And they are entitled to it at no cost. Perhaps you can see why I've taken a few moments why I'm so insistent that no Christian who understands the price of his salvation would spend one single moment attempting to figure out how he can offer as little as possible to the living Christ and still be a Christian. Instead of saying, how close to the dominant culture can I get and still make it to heaven, he should be shouting, how close to heaven can I get and still remain profitable to Christ what time I'm on this planet. No one, no one, please stand with me, no one who has received 
life-changing mercy and abounding love rises from that experience and tries to figure out how much of this destitute world, the practices of this dying generation, or his connection to this decaying culture, he can still hang on to and maintain his relationship with God. No, friend. If you've been touched by this kind of life-transforming grace, your search for the meaning of life has found its fulfillment in the sacrifice of a crucified Savior on a tormented tree. You were the ultimate dead man walking, sentenced to eternity separated from God in a flaming prison called hell. And after your last vestige of hope, had taken wings and flown away. No human governor to commute your eternal sentence. The living Savior, Christ the Lord, set you free from an eternal sentence of indescribable suffering and unendurable torment. This pearl of great price, the end of the quest, the true secret, the ultimate gift and unplumbed depths of his powerful grace. Let us have no discussion of the claims of Christ upon our lives unless we are first a people fully given to him. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for your grace. I thank you that mercy is our cry and grace is your answer. Today, Lord, we reach for you. We reach for the Christ life in the shadow of Calvary's cross and the sacrifice of our Savior. May we who were dead and alive now in Christ live that life that exclaims to everyone around us, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind. And now I see. With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. A choice. I began my discourse with you today by saying, God gives you the ability to choose. His word says, he sets before every one of us life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose who you will serve. And then he helps us. He says, choose life. Today, you're unsure of your eternal destiny. And your response is, but pastor, I go to church. Well, you probably got your car out of your garage this morning. So you probably spent some time in your garage, but it doesn't make you a Christian. Being in church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in your garage makes you a car. But I'm a good person. But God's response is, you must be born again. How can I be born again, you ask? By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, accepting him as your personal savior declaring that he was the price paid for your sins and receiving him in light of Calvary to cleanse your sins and give you eternal life. It's a conscious choice. I'm going to give you an opportunity today 
to make the best choice you've ever made in your life. To say, this day I choose, with my own will, I choose to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. You can know you're on your way to heaven before you leave this building. Without any doubt, you can know it. How good it is to pillow your head every night with the full assurance you're as sure for heaven as if you were already there. Not because of works that you have done, but rather because of the love of Jesus Christ and your acceptance of him as Savior. I'm going to count to three, and when I say three with every head bowed and every eye closed, you want to make that choice today that you'll be glad you made when you stand before God in eternity. And he'll say to you, enter in, my good and faithful servant, to the joy prepared for you from the foundation of the world, oh, to know him. Oh, to know him, not about him, but to know him personally. When I say three, you want that relationship with God through the living Christ. Raise your hand and we're going to pray. At the end of that prayer, as a result of your choice, you'll be as sure for heaven as if you're already there and have a whole lot of heaven to go to heaven in. On three, raise that hand. Do it right now. One, two, three. Raise that hand. Leave it up. Thank you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm weary counting. Can we just lift our hands and say thank you, Lord Jesus? Let's all put our hands right here. Why? That's where your spirit man lives. <laughs> you know, this body is going to pass away. I know we try to pluck it out and paint it in, puff it up, pull it up, snip it off, sew it back. I know that. But someday, yeah, we'll pass from this life. And that's what this life's really all about. Letting as many people know that they can be ready for eternity as we possibly can. So just put your hands right here and let's repeat this. Let's do it out loud so everybody and everybody join us as we reaffirm our faith in Christ. Heavenly Father, I come to you this day. I was born in sin according to your word, and I've committed sins. But I've heard the gospel today, and I've heard that you shed your blood to give me eternal life. I don't deserve it, but your love compelled you to give it to me. And so today, of my own free will, I invite you into my heart. I ask you to forgive my sins and give me eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. I believe it and I receive it and it is so. Thank you. I'm on my way to heaven, and I have heaven to go to heaven in. Amen? Now, it makes me so happy, I just feel like telling everybody. So everybody turn around and tell somebody else, I'm on my way to heaven. Come on. Come on. Do it. Do it. Now turn around and tell somebody else, Christ lives in me. Praise God. Oh, that makes me feel good. Uh, I'm no longer a slave. Just sing one time just for me. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Because today I'm a son. I am a child of God. Sing, Chris. Put your hands together and thank him. Thank you. Get used to talking to him right out loud.
All right, so that was about a third of a chapter of grace, uncovered, unfiltered, undeserved.